From the Toronto Star, I'm Adrian Chung, and this matters. One thousand and nineteen days later, the two Michaels are back home in Canada. Their plane landing on the tarmac lifted an unfathomable weight. These two men have been through an unbelievably difficult situation, but it is inspiring, and it is good news for all of us that they are on their way home to their families. The return of Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig is the biggest development in Canada-China relations in years. After Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou's case was dropped by U.S. officials last week, the dominoes began to fall to bring the two Michaels back home from Chinese detention. Many diplomats and observers said it reminded them of Cold War swaps, a one-for-one -one trade of political prisoners. So what now? How do we make sense of this hostage diplomacy of Canadians? And what does this high-stakes case say about China's power? To unpack it all, we're joined by two Toronto Star reporters who've covered the cases from the start. Joanna Chu, who reports on Canada-China relations and author of China Unbound, A New World Disorder, out September 28th. And Jeremy Nuttall, investigative reporter for The Star, based in Vancouver. Joanna, Jeremy, thank you so much for being here. Hey, Adrian. Thanks for having us. The return of the two Michaels has been years in the making, and the case was at a complete impasse for so long. And then their return seemed like it just happened in a matter of hours. You've both covered this situation from the very beginning. What went through your mind first on the night that the news was breaking of their return? Joanna, I'll turn to you first. Well, I guess there had been kind of rumors that a deal was kind of in the works between Meng Wanzhou's lawyers and U.S. prosecutors, but, you know, we had been hearing about it for months, so we weren't, like, waiting for the news to break or anything, so it was really a surprise. And it wasn't surprising that as soon as she was able to, after the U.S. court authorities made the decision to resolve the case, and the B.C. court, you know, looked at her bail that she was out of Vancouver ASAP. That part wasn't surprising. But even after she was wheels up, heading back to China, most people expected that Beijing would take a while to release the two Michaels because throughout the more than 1,000 days they were arrested, China kept denying that their cases were in retaliation for Meng's arrest. So to keep up the pretense, it was expected that they would at least wait a few weeks, if not months, and make up some sort of excuse. Like, actually, Cyber had already received his verdict, a guilty verdict, while COVID was in limbo. So we were expecting maybe Kovrig's case, somehow that would get thrown out or some they would make up some excuse for Stab or maybe he was going to come back to Canada for medical treatment or something like that. But instead, they were actually, you know, leaving China the same day. So that was really a shock for a lot of people. Jeremy, what were you thinking? Well, it was the whole thing was was a shock. I mean, I, I had absolutely no idea that this was going to happen on Friday. I, I woke up to my phone and emails exploding because we're out here on the West Coast, of course, so we're a few hours behind. I mean, it wasn't, it was a shock that it happened when it happened, but it wasn't a shock that it happened. I mean, we were expecting this. I mean, back, back a few months ago, the Wall Street Journal had a, uh, uh, had an article that said that this is happening and it kind of got the timing wrong. So I get, I, what I think happened is that Meng Wanzhou had the deal in front of her back when the Wall Street Journal broke the original article. I want to say it was May. And she, for whatever reason, turned the deal down. And then uh, she had her last two uh, attempts in her hearing in Vancouver, and those were unsuccessful. So she was looking down the barrel of, of losing her extradition hearing. So then I think she decided to pull the trigger on signing the deal. But it was definitely a There has been so much that has happened here in a legal sense that I think it's worth just taking one quick step back for a moment to talk about that side of the Meng Wanzhou case that really got everything moving. What exactly did the Huawei executive agree to or admit to in that statement of facts? Well, I think the main thing that she, uh, that she admitted is that it was true that she did mislead the bank. She did make false statements. She says that in the statement of facts, she agrees to it. That to me is the biggest one because this whole entire thing was, was based on the idea uh, that 
you know, she didn't, she didn't do that or, or, oh, it's, it wasn't a, what she did wasn't a crime in Canada, so she shouldn't be extradited for it, etc. But now we know that the original allegations were in fact true. She's admitting basically the crux of the U.S. prosecutor's argument against her, but she did not plead guilty. And that's what some reports got wrong at, at the beginning when news was breaking that she, she wasn't planning to plead guilty and she didn't plead guilty. So it's admitting wrongdoing without admitting guilt. So that helps her escape criminal liability. And that's probably significant because she would probably find it difficult to continue operating as a Huawei CFO if she had this on her record as this guilty sentence. And you've got to wonder what that does for guilty charge or no. I, I wonder what that does for her reputation and for the company's reputation going forward. Because any other, you know, I mean, along with the other investigation that's going on uh, in, into Huawei, and the other allegations made in the indictment against the company, you now have the CFO admitting, you know, to doing wrong, essentially, though, as Joanna points out, not admitting guilt. So, yeah, one has to wonder what that means for Huawei uh, as they move on. Even now, China continues to maintain that the Meng Wanzhou case had nothing to do with the detention of the two Michaels. Canada, of course, has disputed this since day one. But just seeing how this played out, and Joanna, you, you mentioned this sort of off the top, is there any doubt that this is exactly what we all thought it was, that the two Michaels were essentially hostages for retribution of Meng's arrest? Is there any doubt of that? No, like there was already no doubt. Trudeau has said that Chinese officials, senior officials have made it really clear to him, to senior levels of Canadian government, that the two Michaels were being held um, and won't be released until Meng was free. So uh, there was no doubt even before all of this happened. But now what they're there's no doubt about is that the Chinese government has no qualms about it and does not really seem ashamed of what happened. I think the state media, when it does, you know, touch on the cases, um, talks about them as if it's very justified, as if what happened to Meng was somehow on par, even though she was free to live in one of her two mansions in Vancouver and move freely around the city and, you know, visit her friends and family, where the two Michaels were essentially tortured because they were in isolation lights on in their cells 24 hours a day. Michael has since said that sometimes he would be reduced to kind of surviving on only rice and boiled vegetables. That certainly wasn't the case for Hmong. As far as like Jeremy was talking about her reputation, I think it's only grown and improved domestically where she's kind of seen as this hero and just someone who suffered persecution from the West. And I don't think Huawei would suffer like its business in China, but there has to be some sort of impact on its international business now. And it is also important to note that this doesn't mean it's the end of hostage taking diplomacy. There are still foreigners who are being held in China for political reasons, very murky reasons, or sometimes obvious political backlash, such as several Australian citizens who were detained and similarly to the Michaels accused of national security violations in the midst of the Australian government government kind of being quite forceful in its criticisms of China. So we shouldn't really see this as kind of like a resolution of all tensions because these continue. And the fact that the two Michaels were returned so quickly with no kind of apology or shame around the fact that they were treating us hostages makes me, even though I'm a, a friend of Kovrig's and really relieved to see him home and looking relatively healthy, it makes me worried that this doesn't actually change anything. And that if I were personally living in Beijing right now, I wouldn't feel safer because of what happened. Jerry, what do you think about how Chinese state media especially has played this? The first thing is like to look at it this way is that the Canadian system did not buckle. Despite what people are saying, we never gave up Meng Wanzhou to get the Michaels back directly. And even the Canadian ambassador to the US has said this, said this yesterday on television, that the, uh, the explicit, the DPA was separate from getting them back. So the Canadian system didn't buckle. Meng Wanzhou signed her DPA to avoid being extradited when she was maybe six weeks away from losing her extradition case. So in a lot of senses, you can say that China didn't win this at all. And there's a lot of stuff right now happening domestically in China. There's questions about the economy. That's the biggest one. Nobody's really sure what's going on 100% there, but there's indications that there's a recession there. And so she has some problems at home. And so I think Xi Jinping is trying to make this look like a win, A, to uh, sort of bolster national sentiment. And this is what you're seeing in Chinese media, as well as to uh, sort of distract from what, what some of the other things that are happening in China right now. So, yeah, you're seeing Chinese state media 
trying to, to spin this into a victory and a win about the power of China. And now nobody can mess with China, et cetera, et cetera, which was expected. However, the first couple of days, I think what was notice- noticeable is that they didn't mention the statement of fact and how Meng Wanzhou you know, admitted to wrongdoing, et cetera. Yeah, they're, they're, they're clearly just trying to spin it as a win. No surprise there. And I think what Canadian media needs to do is, is not take their version of it as fact. And I've seen some reporters doing that. So, yeah, no, no surprises. We'll be right back. Joanna, you wrote about this in your book about China's geopolitical power, China Unbound. But in this case, what sort of message do you think has China sent about its intent and its powers across borders? Of course, Jeremy just said there of of how they want to spin it. But what sort of message do you think many nations around the world will get from this case? I think right as soon as the two Michaels were taken so blatantly back in late 2018, it finally kind of woke a lot of people living in um, more rich Western countries up about the more, uh, the very aggressive nature uh, of China's stance towards any kind of conflicts with it perceives of foreign countries. Whereas in the past, as my book looks at, because I actually traveled all over the world to different Western countries as case studies to see how, say, in Italy, Greece, Turkey, Australia, and in US and Canada, how they developed their China policies. And for a long time, and you know, to today, a lot of just China policy for many countries was how can we get as much money from the China market as possible? How many deals can we cut with the Chinese government? How many trade deals? Like just expand, expand as much as possible, seeing it as this kind of like pot of gold because of the huge population of 1.4 billion people. And, you know, China's growing power on the world stage while feeling immune to any of the negative repercussions, basically, knowing that China has taken lots of political prisoners from different countries and had 2015 kidnapped Hong Kong dual citizens who were Hong Kongers as well as British and Swedish from places like Thailand when they're vacationing to just force them into mainland Chinese prisons. This was happening years before the two Michaels and the Meng Wanzhou story was a story. But a lot of Western governments, I think, were feeling very in in this position of privilege that it wouldn't happen to their citizens. It wouldn't happen to, you know, middle class privileged Canadian citizens. But when it did, I think it finally got people thinking that, no, we're not prepared and we don't understand China very well at all. What's troubling is that despite this growing awareness, it hasn't come with concrete policy changes. Ottawa, you know, Jeremy can talk about this more. He's been tracking it closer, has been promising this reset for a more kind of robust and nuanced China strategy. But it, it, it's been years and it hasn't come. And Canada has also delayed making any decision on Huawei technology, whereas all of Canada's allies have you know, made a decision whether to restrict or partially ban or ban entirely Huawei from participating in development of 5G networks of security concerns. It's an important decision to make one way or the other. Like, I don't have a stance on, I'm not a security expert, but Canada has just deferred, deferred and forced uh, Canadian companies to make their own decisions. And sort of going on what Joanna said here is, is yeah, this wasn't the first case of this. There's, for instance, Hussein Silil and others, but another high profile case that was just, you know, in t- 2012, I believe it was 2012 when it all happened, or maybe 2013 was the when Kevin Garrett and his uh, wife were... Uh, also taken hostage by the Chinese government in retaliation for the arrest of Sue Bin, uh, which makes it kind of hard to believe when we have some Canadian politicians, et cetera, saying, oh, well, we've seen the real nastiness of the Chinese regime. I mean, this happened already once before. And, you know, we still continued to expand with China. We, we were in talks for a free trade agreement with them after the Garrett incident. Uh, the Canadian government just doesn't seem to be interested in reading the tea leaves and and going on experience and making prudent decisions based on that. It's uh, it's quite remarkable, really. But uh, when you consider the business interests um, intertwined with political interests on the China file, it's not surprising. Well, I was going to ask, what leverage do most nations like Canada even have against China in cases of diplomacy like this? There's what they say, and then there's what they do. Is there actually leverage there? There's certainly like, for instance, when China had a pork shortage a couple of years back, Canada upped its pork exports to the country rather than, you know, even freezing them or stopping them, you know? So like 
our, our leverage in situations like that is mainly what we do export to them, which isn't much. I mean, they're only about 4% of our exports. And a lot of people forget that. And about, I think it's 12% of our imports. So, you know, the actual trade relationship, while it, while, while it is significant, it's not as significant as some would have us believe. So I think that's part of the problem with this conversation is that there's this myth that if we have bad relations with China, that we're all going to starve here in Canada. Yeah. So this was something I try to debunk in my book, this narrative around the whole Huawei Hmong issue that Canada was this victim stuck in the middle of this tussle between two superpowers, China and the U.S., in which we were completely powerless and completely the victim stuck in the middle. And I think this was disingenuous because for years, decades, Canada has kind of benefited at times when there had been, you know, spikes in tension between the U.S. and China. For example, lobster, just one kind of trade item. When Washington and Beijing were in dispute in the past and there was a ban on importing lobsters from the U.S., Canada benefited. Uh, Nova Scotia benefited. Their lobster trade with China increased tenfold. And this was kind of really celebrated in, by Canadian politicians. Whenever things like this would happen, we're benefiting now. This is good for Canada. And I was actually there in Beijing because I was working there in 2015 when Prime Minister Trudeau went to China trying to cut this free trade deal with China. And it really underscored that whole experience, which on the whole, I think at the time, his entourage, like his political aides, told me off the record, uh, on background, that it was very embarrassing for him because I think it really exemplified how Canada felt like it could be both. It could, on the one hand, criticize China's human rights issues, kind of making statements and also, you know, putting money behind it, like helping to fund rule of law efforts in China. But at the other time, pursue, you know, trade deals and that counterparts in China would accept that and be fine with it. But actually, the trade deal proposal from Trudeau was kind of slapped back into his face because he wanted to include some provisions on labor rights and things like that. But it really seemed that our government expected that China would be accepting of kind of this bundle that they could have relations with Canada and agree to respect human rights. And I think that kind of showed how they didn't really understand. Yeah, the China's political system, especially on Xi Jinping, I started reporting in China just as he was coming to power. And again, there was this optimism from internationally that he would be reformer, that China would go in a liberal direction. But it was pretty dystopian, like my work ended up being because people, my sources who were out of previously pretty moderate voices, like lawyers who were in pretty established prominent roles in China, suddenly they became targets and hundreds of lawyers, hundreds of academics who were well-respected in China just years before she came to power were suddenly in jail, disappeared, or they would show up later not being able to talk about what happened to them and, and no longer working as lawyers, for example. Yeah, I'm glad you, I haven't read the book yet, Joanna, but I'm certainly glad you touched on that because it's, it is very important that people realize that this sort of bizarre, oh, we're caught in the middle of two superpowers thing is, is not accurate. I know this is a perhaps a, a big question to end on, but what is the state of Canada and China's relationship now? I mean, it does seem like something, at least publicly, has fundamentally changed. And by the same token, I also wonder what this means for Canadians who want to visit China for the foreseeable future, knowing that there are still more than 100 detained Canadians, Global Affairs says. Where do things stand now? Well... The first thing I'll, I'll let Joanna have the last word. I just want to say this quick is that we're going to, in the next week and a half month in the, in the coming time, we're going to hear a lot of the usual suspects saying that now we should put this behind us and reset relations with China back to normal. And I think a lot of other experts would tell you, no, no, that's impossible. After this, there is no back to normal. There is no reset. We haven't really had any indications yet from the federal government what they're going to do. That I think is a question that they're going to have to answer this week if they're going to answer it publicly. And if they don't, I think that's a huge sign of concern. Yeah, I think it's important because people want some easy answers, like what's the way we can get it all, continue engaging with China, which is important because I don't think any serious commentator is advocating for treating China like a pariah state, like North Korea or something like that. It's just not possible or realistic or probably productive because it probably would make the civil rights situation for Chinese citizens even worse. But I think what's missing is that a lot of countries are just 
reacting to things happening. And it's clear when you just look at who is in cabinet, who is in senior positions, advising the government, that there's virtually very little China expertise in all of these major Western countries. And that's very worrying when, you know, the kind of question of how to deal with China's growing authoritarianism going global, affecting foreign citizens, meaning that people on Canadian soil are afraid to speak up because they worry, like Jeremy and I have both reported on, that Chinese officials would show up on the doorsteps in Canada, in Vancouver, to threaten them or order families. There's no answer to that. But I think one of you know the most practical and you know expected steps would be to make sure that in government there's people who know China, who know China's political situation, not just their economic situation, to be there to help guide and steer things as it's still unclear whether tensions will just continue ramping up, especially with the US continuing some of its kind of tough postures in China, or whether things will kind of simmer down. But either way, I think the lack of China experience in government has been really apparent and very worrying these last few years. Joanna, Jeremy, thank you so much to both of you and for all of your thoughts on this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks for having us on. Thanks, Adrian, for having us on. And that is our two Toronto Star reporters on Canada-China relations, Joanna Chu and Jeremy Nuttall. That's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. I'm your host, Adrian Chung. Our This Matters team is me, Adrian Chung, Brian Bradley, JP Fozo, Matt Hearn, Morgan Bachnick, Raju Mudar, Saba Aitazaz, and Sean Patton. Our music is by So Called, Mike DeAngelis, and Sean Patton. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us your comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at the star.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at the star.com slash subscribing matters. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon.